Good evening. Welcome to this time of prayer and Bible study with the family of St. Andrew's Baptist Church in Columbia, South Carolina. I'm Pastor D. Vaughn, and on behalf of our staff and our church family, I'm delighted to welcome you. You're part of our family tonight, just because you've joined us to lift up your heart to God and share your heart with others and be attentive to God's Word as we're going to study together in just a little while. I want to share some things with you as a church family that are going on that I know you'll want to keep in your mind and, and in your prayers. Right now, we are continuing a food drive where we're inviting you to donate non-perishable food items, bring them to the church. We have a box outside the door. You can just drop off your food items in that box and we empty it several times a day and we'll process the food. We're going to share this food with our community through Harvest Hope uh, Food Bank. Uh, they are masters at uh, distributing food and, and serving the needs of those who have hunger issues. And so we're partnering with them in this effort. They've been short of donations uh, because of the coronavirus. So we're looking to help them. We also have had some circumstances where we've learned of some people in our community right around us who needed help and we've helped them directly. And some of your donations may go to that if those needs are, uh, if we're aware of needs like that at the time that you give. So thank you, bring it by during uh, office hours and you can leave it in the box or if you need someone to come out and help you bring your food in, we'll be delighted to do that. But thank you for sharing some of the most basic needs Think of Jesus saying, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. What we do for them, we do for him. And uh, thank you for being a part of that. This past Sunday was our give of your best emphasis. And uh, among the things that we share on that day is our give of your best offering. This year's offering is being used to set aside up to $10,000 for the expenses of re-entering our church. We are purchasing some equipment to be able to disinfect our buildings thoroughly uh, between each usage. Um, there's some extra supplies we need. We're trying to reduce the situations where you have to physically touch the building for sanitizer or soap or, or whatever it might be. We're working to make the building as safe and, uh, and friendly for you as it possibly can be. So up to $10,000 will be used for that purpose and all gifts beyond that amount are going into our maintenance reserve funds because we have several heating and cooling systems that need to be replaced. Some of them are just barely limping along and uh, they've only served us for you know 50 years or 55 years so uh, I, I think we've gotten our good out of them but it's time to get something new and uh, we want to save and replace these. We don't want to go into debt, not a single dollar if we can avoid it. So all that we have in savings will help us tremendously in those big ticket items that it takes to keep a church up to date and operating. So thank you for your generosity in that. I want to mention to you both for your prayers and just for your information that our weekday preschool has reopened. They began Monday and uh, it's a new process because we're in a different day right now. Uh, temperatures are taken at the door and parents don't get to come into the building. They drop their children off at the door and workers take them to their classrooms and uh, then parents pick them up at the door in the evening. And of course, we're being very mindful of the health of all of the children and all of their rooms are being disinfected every day. Um, and in some ways all through the day. Uh, we've always been sticklers for cleanliness in the weekday preschool, but even more so now uh, with the coronavirus uh, among us. But we're grateful that they're reopening and uh, pray for Mary Christie and all of her faculty and staff as they're working to care for these beautiful children. Um, as parents are going back to work, some of them are able to go back to work uh, and um, they need care for their kids, so we're grateful that we can do that. Remember that we'll worship together Sunday morning at 1030 on our Facebook page and on YouTube. Um, 
This Sunday, we're going to talk about a passage from Psalm 23, a section of that matchless psalm that teaches us how to get through life's valleys. This has been a valley time for many people, health-wise, financially, just the disruption of life. In that psalm, we have so much wisdom and so much love from God that shows us how we can get through times like these. And I want to share that with you Sunday morning. So you be here and invite others to share this time with us. Some of you have done some great outreach just in saying, I want you to tune in to Facebook or to YouTube and worship with our church family. And we've had some new friends join us and some have become regulars. And we're delighted in that. Uh, when we share the good things of God, his family grows. And, and we're delighted that, that that's happening. But you join us for for worship coming up on Sunday at 1030. I know that you have prayer requests and concerns, and if you'll enter those all throughout this time we're together through your comments. When you enter comments, then others can read what's on your heart and mind and can pray with you and pray for you. And uh, that's a way to make this an open prayer time, uh, as we would do where we're here together in person. So as there are things on your heart, you enter those and uh, it'll allow all of us to know of your needs and uh, to pray with you in a special way. I want to name three situations that are very critical right now. Uh, be in prayer for Bill Williams. He is in the Agape Hospice House, the one located near the church, and is receiving care there. Uh, that entire facility is for patients who are COVID-19 positive. And so, uh, as Betty and Kim have been able to spend some time with Bill, they've had to take incredible precautions with goggles and headwear and masks and gowns and gloves and all the rest. And uh, they're giving him all the love and support they can. But uh, pray, pray for him because... Uh, if the doctors are correct, this is the last chapter of his life with us. And so, so it's an incredibly important time for their family, and they need your love and prayers. We have been praying for Nelson Berry for several years. He's been battling cancer. Nelson is in the Agape Care Facility in Lexington, and he is receiving hospice care as well. Um, he's exhausted every possibility of treatment, and his family has loved and supported him and cheered him on through all of this. But uh, he and his doctors recognize that the cure, physical cure in this life, is not a realistic goal. And so the focus has changed to his comfort and his well-being and his being able to fill these days as full of life and love as he possibly can. So pray for Nelson and uh, for Al and Evelyn and all of that family as this is a a very trying time for them and a sad time. And then Gene Bain, who is a member of our congregation, had an accident. He was in the backyard at his son Max's house, their family home, working on a project and um, fell. And when he did, his artificial knee broke loose from the rest of his leg, uh, tearing the flesh and causing incredible bleeding. Gene had his cell phone with him and called into the house and his daughter-in-law heard his call and went to him immediately, called an ambulance, but Gene lost a lot of blood in the process and when he got to the hospital they needed to amputate that leg to save his life. They couldn't deal with the bleeding any other way. And uh, so Gene is in a critical time right now we pray that he'll have the strength to pull through this. But if he does, there's another surgery that will need to take place like tomorrow and many other challenges ahead. So you pray for Gene and uh, for Mac and Carrie and their family as they're supporting him and trying to cheer him on through uh, this terrible ordeal that he's facing. Well, this is a very happy day for the Vaughn family. Today is our Juliana's first birthday. And we'll be celebrating that with her today. And uh, we just uh, are blessed to see the unfolding miracle of her life. Uh, I praise God that I'm a part of that story. And uh, 
that he's allowed me to see her young life begin and see her grow. She's walking some now, and uh, therefore we're chasing a lot more than we used to. I want us to go to God now in uh, a time of prayer. Continue to enter your requests as, as you need to, to share them with one another. But as we go to God, allow me to lead as we pray. Father, we come to you knowing that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. And knowing that all of the good gifts of life are from your hand. We're not just blessed to know good gifts. We're blessed to know the giver. And when we come to you as the source of it all, we not only have the resources we need, we have the relationship we need most. And so we thank you that we can come to you today remembering the many, many ways you're loving and blessing and caring for us. We pray for those with special needs, those we've named tonight, and others that our friends are naming through their comments right now. We pray for our nation in this time of health emergency. We lift up our leaders who have to make important decisions about policy and, and safe procedures and reopening issues and, and all of this. Please, Father, help them to see beyond any political pressure and to do the right and loving thing for all involved. We pray for doctors and other health care workers who are on the front lines of this battle. They continue to fight day and night for the lives of people. We pray that you would strengthen and protect them and the holy work that they're doing on behalf of all of us. I lift up our church family. We're grateful for opportunities like this to be together through the internet, but we miss each other. And we miss the family experience of being together. And Father, when the time is right, we look forward to being together in your house again. But until then, make us faithful friends to keep up with one another, to love each other, to do all that we can to serve each other in your name. As we continue to look at your word tonight, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and write upon our hearts the truths by which we can live abundantly and live faithfully for you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share a song with you before we go to our Bible study. A song about love, because love is our standard of all that we do. And, and we're going to see what happens when we lose sight of, of that standard and become judges of one another in our Bible study tonight. So uh, this is called Without Love. I can have faith to move mountains Talk of things to come Yes, I can open up my bag of tricks Maybe I'll fool some but without love, I am nothing at all. Without love, I am nothing at all. Mm -hmm. I can give all my worldly goods. So in love. 
love your neighbor as yourself Can you be whole But without love You are nothing at all Without love What an amazing truth and a clear standard that we're to live by. Tonight we move into chapter 7 of the Gospel of Matthew, the final chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. And in this chapter, Jesus begins by talking about the way we relate to others and how we try to make ourselves judges, unworthy judges, and how that's not God's will and God's way. Matthew 7, beginning at verse 1. Listen to what Jesus says. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Sometimes when I hear people speak of this passage, I think they misunderstand Jesus' intent. That's so easy for us to do in all of Scripture, isn't it? When Jesus says, do not judge, you need to know what he means and what he doesn't mean. Jesus is not asking us to lack discernment. He's not asking us to lack wisdom. He's not asking us to lay aside our capacity to see what is true and what is false, and what is right and what is wrong. We are to judge in that sense. We're to be wise. We're to be holy. And that requires us to make decisions about situations, about issues, and sometimes about people. But the thrust of the word that Jesus uses here for judge could also be translated, don't condemn. What Jesus is saying is that we don't have the right to punish and condemn others for their wrongdoings. We're not to take that role upon ourselves. We're not to carry out the sentence when we think someone is wrong. And he tells us why. He says, or you too will be judged. Now, I think there are two levels of meaning to that that are both important. One of them is on the human level. That if you and I go around with an attitude that we're catching others in all of their wrongdoings, and if we're treating them differently because of that, if we're ostracizing them, if we're rejecting them because of that, then we're creating a world in which that's going to happen to us too. We too have clay feet. We too make mistakes. And the standard by which we're treating others will be the standard that will probably come back to us. And we may find that when the shoe is on the other foot, it's indeed uncomfortable. But even more importantly, Jesus is saying, you do not judge others or you too will be judged by God. We talked earlier in our study of the Sermon on the Mount about forgiving and asking God to forgive us as we forgive others. And we remembered the truth that if you don't believe in forgiveness, if you believe in condemnation, if that's your attitude toward others, then that is going to block the door of your heart even to the mercy of God. If you make yourself a self-righteous judge, you're making yourself God, and you've left no room for the mercy of the true and the living God. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, Jesus says. 
So don't make yourself a judge unless you're prepared to be judged. Don't ask for a heavenly audit unless you're ready for it. Jesus uses some hyperbole. He overstates the case with an example that's totally obvious to us to drive home a spiritual truth that we don't seem to get so easily. He says in verse 3, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. What Jesus is saying here is it's so easy for us to condemn the smallest faults and shortcomings of others while we overlook the major flaws in our own lives. And in fact, the way he describes this, he, he describes someone who may have that little speck that feels so big when it gets in your eye and is so painful, but may be so small it's almost impossible to find. And he said, imagine that you've offered to help someone get that speck out of their eye while you have a board, a plank, that is stuck in your own eye. Now, how in the world could you be available, accessible, equipped to help someone else when you were in such a situation? Obviously, you can't at all. But Jesus said that's the way it is when we judge. We are so focused on the small things that are sins of others that we miss the major sins in our own hearts, our judgmental attitude being one of them our desire to condemn instead of learning to forgive and heal. Jesus says you need to start with your own issues before you worry too much about those of someone else. I've had friends who've been involved in the, the program Alcoholics Anonymous and as they've shared things that they've learned, one of these principles that they often speak of and guide their work by is that you work on your inventory, not someone else's. I think Jesus would agree. Think about your spirit. Think about your heart. Think about your attitude. And when you work on that, you won't have much time or motivation to call up every little thing that others do that's wrong. In fact, you'll develop more compassion because you're aware that you too were just a sinner saved by grace and not someone in a position to judge. Jesus says be careful because that attitude puts you in the place of God. You be busy loving people. Now, loving people sometimes requires us to be tough Sometimes love says no. Sometimes love says no more. Sometimes love sets a limit, for sure. But we don't do that to condemn someone. We do it only to help them get better. We do it only to motivate them to deal with their pain and problems and take responsibility for their lives. So he says, don't judge. It's not your job. You can't do it well. Because not only is it abusive of others, it blinds you to your own need of God's grace at work in your life. Don't miss your plank while trying to find someone else's speck. And then in verse 6, the verse that, that seems kind of rough, it's, uh, it's strong language. But Jesus is talking about an important issue and a strong issue. He says in verse 6, Do not give dogs what is sacred, and do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet, and then turn 
and tear you to pieces. Now, many of us have dogs that are pets that are in our home. They're domesticated and lovable and all the rest. When Jesus described dogs here, he was talking about wild dogs, dogs that might roam the streets in packs, dogs that might be diseased and pass disease on to you, dogs that might attack you, might choose to try to make a meal out of you. Jesus said you don't give what's sacred to them, and you don't throw your pearls a pearl was the most precious stone that anyone knew about in Jesus' world at the time he was there. You don't give those to pigs. Why does he say that? What's he talking about? Two things that I know of. One, Jesus was saying, understand that as you share the good news, as you share the gospel with others, there's some who just won't receive it. They are so hardened of heart and of mind, they're not able to hear. And he said, you can spend all your time beating your head against that wall of the one who won't respond and miss many other opportunities to share God's love with people who will. Now, is Jesus saying give up on people? I don't think so. I don't think he gave up on people. But he knew when it was time to go on. He knew when it was time to say, I'm at the end of what I can do, and I must entrust this person, this situation, this need to God's grace and move on to others that are in my life. The other thing that I think of with this passage that is so helpful and so needful is that you and I need to be very thoughtful about who we share our innermost selves with. Not everyone is capable of treating your secrets, maybe the painful side of your life, maybe the difficulties you're facing. Some are just not capable of treating that responsibly. You know, as, as we have a toddler now around our house, one is learning to walk, we've seen that there are a number of things we just have to move to higher ground. You can't leave something on top of an end table now that might be dangerous. You can't leave a knife or, you know, a metal frame with a picture in it or anything like that because Juliana's not capable of knowing those things will hurt her. Jesus says, when you think about sharing your heart, what's precious, what's sacred about you with others, be sure that you're sharing it with someone who's trustworthy. Be very discerning. Because when you say too much to those who don't have the maturity or the character to manage it, they'll tear you to pieces. They may turn on you. If they have a weakness of gossip that they just need to know the, the latest, the juiciest information to feel like somebody, they'll take what you've shared with them and use it to make themselves feel important. Or if they are self-righteous, if, if they struggle with this issue of being judgmental, they may take what you've shared with them and use it as a weapon against you to put you down, maybe in their relationship with you or in the sight of other people. You have a great blessing when you have a small circle of Christian friends with whom you can share your heart without a second thought. You give someone a holy place when you give them a place where they're safe and secure in being who they are and sharing whatever is going on in their lives. I hope you aspire to be that kind of friend as I do. But when it's your time to need a friend, when it's your time that you need to be heard and you need to be confident that what you have shared won't be used to hurt you, be careful. Be careful. Not just any and every person, not even any and every person who names the name of Christ is capable of handling the holiest parts of your life responsibly. 
So be discerning, Jesus says. There are things too precious in your life to allow them to be trampled, to allow them to be abused. Now, as I say that, I need to do so in a spirit of thanksgiving because I do have friends in my life whom I can trust completely and with whom I can share anything. I'm grateful for that. And I hope that you're cultivating those kinds of friendships within our church and with others. But the place to help that happen in this world that you and I have control over is to be that kind of friend. To be a friend who listens and who loves. A friend who knows when we're walking on holy ground and will never use what we know to hurt someone who's trusted us with it. We're going to stop there for today. I hope that you have a wonderful week. And I look forward to seeing you Sunday morning as we'll worship God together and think about how we get through life's valleys. Let me say a word of blessing over you before we part ways. May God set you free from the need to judge. May you place that role totally in His hands as the only one who's capable of knowing it all and the only one who's qualified to render judgment. And as you're set free from that task, may you be free to love. May you be free to give others the best of who you are and what you know. And may you and I be the kinds of friends others can trust, that they'll never look back upon us with regret, but they'll look upon us and say there was a true friend who handled that part of my life that I shared with them in a trustworthy and a loving way. May you be that kind of friend. I look forward to seeing you Sunday. God bless you with a good week. Bye-bye.